This evening's event is titled The New Era in Human Service Delivery, how the hub model has inspired a shift towards upstream community safety and you know, well-being. Uh, so I really look forward to you know, this evening's presentation. Over the years, we've had a variety of topics, uh, all relevant to uh, criminal justice and public safety um, in, our, in our community. Before we get into the uh, uh, context of tonight and the specific content, I'd like to acknowledge uh, some contributions you know, made, one by the, uh, the Correctional Service of Canada, and uh, secondly, the College of Law, uh, which is a you know, co-sponsor for this event and contributed accordingly, as well as the uh, College of Arts and Science, uh, which, whose building we are in you know, this, this evening. I should mention that uh, this is a traditional um, you know, protocol. Um, this theater is designated a, uh, I just want to say non-smoking, a, a, a non-food and drink uh, auditorium, so I'd ask you to... Uh, Please I mean, keep that in mind. <laughs> I've done this every year. It's getting a little hackneyed, but, but what the heck. And I really like the peanut butter things with marshmallows. Um, and no, I mean, if you could just at the end of the evening or if you, when you uh, depart, be sure to clean up any uh, evidence that you might have of uh, you know, consumption I mean, in, in the auditorium here. With respect to our topic, over the past six years, Saskatchewan's hub model of collaborative risk-driven intervention has led Canada in a nationwide paradigm shift toward upstream approaches to human service delivery. By relying less on incident response and more on risk detection, we are seeing opportunities for mitigating risk before harm occurs. The key component of such pragmatic change is a multi-sectoral collaboration. We're very fortunate you know, this evening as a leading expert in this emerging field, Dr. Chad Nielsen will provide a balanced overview of different Canadian initiatives uh, that challenge the conventional human service I mean, delivery. Uh, following the presentation, you know, we will learn uh, the perspective of three major you know, contributors um, with respect to this powerful movement, which we'll get to uh, a little bit later in, in the evening. I'm confident that you will walk away with an understanding of this cutting edge you know, social innovation, but also be aware of the incredible amount of work yet to be done. And so indeed, in spirit of our self-proclaimed forensic center mandate is I mean, community involvement, community engagement, and community activity that leads to uh, a safer community and uh, more well-being for uh, our, our community and representatives. I mentioned Dr. Chad Nielsen. Um, delighted to, to, to have him here this evening. Uh, Chad, in fact, was the inaugural research fellow in the Forensic Center when we opened up earlier in this, this decade. He is currently a community-engaged scholar with the university and still maintains his affiliation with the Forensic Center, um, a fact for which we're, we're very indebted. Dr. Nielsen is one of Canada's leading experts in community safety and well-being. His contributions from both a measurement and practitioner perspective have made an impact in First Nations and non-Indigenous communities across the country, beginning in Prince Albert, more broadly in Saskatchewan, and then I mean, across the country to, to numerous communities, which we'll have an opportunity to hear a little bit uh, about momentarily. We'll, Chad will begin with our sort of keynote presentation, setting the stage and uh, descriptively about the hub and his experiences over the last half dozen or so years. We'll have a break and then we'll convene with a panel, which we'll I mean, talk about uh, with respect to introductions after the short few minute, 10 minute break or so, and then uh, have a, a question and answer uh, um, session I mean, to, to follow up the, the panel of three uh, experts in this field. When I first heard of the idea of the hub, you know, I'm an, an old sort of hockey sports fan, and I kept he hearing Chad and others talk about this hub thing, and you know what I kept thinking of? Any sports fans here? Uh, the hub, the Boston Bruins, 
the logo on the Boston Bruins sweater. I mean, you go to Beantown, they think they're the hub of the universe. And so we've got this, you know, the, 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 hub, the hub is actually the, you know, their logo. So uh, I know, pretty corny, but uh, to carry this metaphor on, I'd like to introduce and welcome the captain of the hub on this team, Dr. Chad Nielsen. Chad. <laughs> Thanks, Steve. Thanks, uh, thanks so much, and uh, thanks everyone for being here. Funny enough, I've been working with Steve for about uh, six years now, and uh, actually didn't know you're a huge Bruins fan. That's uh, kind of how I was raised, so it kind of worked out pretty good. I think the guys uh, from PA will probably uh, heckle you a little bit back on the whole uh, center of the universe thing, but uh, go Leafs. So, okay, and yeah, now the gloves are off already. Hey, uh, thanks so much again for for being here, everyone. And uh, as uh, as Steve alluded. There is a, a large uh, group of uh, listeners and viewers uh, on, uh, on the internet tonight. Uh, the last count we had was uh, 848 people logged in and watching it. So there's kind of a trade-off is, uh, of course, uh, you offer something online, you could sit in your living room with a nice cozy fire, or you can uh, trudge the snow and lovely parking at the university to come here in person. Uh, thank you so much uh, for those of you who, who have come here tonight. And for those of you who have uh, logged in on the internet, thanks uh, so much for your time. Uh, we do have uh, folks literally from coast to coast that have uh, logged in tonight, uh, from Prince Edward Island all the way to, uh, to uh, the west coast of British Columbia. So uh, pretty exciting night. Uh, and later on tonight, I'm going to actually tell you about a, a, a new initiative that, uh, that we're pursuing that actually has technology as a major component. So uh, the fact that uh, we've had a, a good uptake on technology is important for this, this, this model. So tonight what we wanted to talk about was uh, an innovation in, 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 in society that involves a lot of different groups. And over the last 20 years, when you've had innovations, you've had innovations come within specific sectors, such as policing, such as health, or education, or addictions, or housing. And so if you go to the library across the hall and you open up any textbook from the last 50 years, seldom do those innovations involve an entire uh, command of services across the spectrum. And the hub model is one of the first services that, that took that courageous jump to involve everyone and not move forward unless everyone was, was there. So back to the, the sports analogy, uh, this was an all hands on deck approach and, and getting to, to where the hub model is today uh, and where it needs to go tomorrow continues to be something that requires all human services, not just criminal justice, not just uh, health or, or education. And so uh, it, the exciting part tonight uh, is, uh, of course, to describe to you what the hub model is and what it has done uh, across Canada. But more importantly, the big theme tonight is what is the hub inspired in terms of innovating community safety and well-being across Canada? So as a concept, the hub model is a venue for information sharing. And so those of you who maybe have experience in the human service sector, those of you who have, who have uh, worked in government or, or volunteered for organizations, you know that each organization has its own mandate, has its own, uh, its own group of clients, has its own target group that it tries to, tries to, uh, to uh, connect with. The hub is an opportunity where all of those services can be engaged with that client uh, in, in, uh, in a quick meeting. And the importance of this, as we'll describe a little bit later, is largely our human service system waits until something happens, waits until there's an incident, wait until there's a crisis, and then they'll respond. And that's why we have victim services, and that's why we have emergency rooms, and that's why we have 911. The reality is, if you look at all these reports, those of you in the education sector, you think of your incident response reports, or those of you that work in addictions and you, you have your, your relapse plan, all of those different things that come into play you could have a little bit different perspective of them if you work in a collaborative context. And so tonight we're going to explore what the hub model has done to that collaborative context. But then, of course, what are some of the other social innovations that have been inspired by or at least uh, motivated by uh, some of the momentum uh, carried with the, with the hub model. So as a concept, uh, the hub is an opportunity for different human service providers to, uh, to collaborate with one another and to do something that's a little bit different than what has been done in the past. That difference is working together in an upstream fashion. And so uh, for many years, there has been great uh, uh, developments in case management, in wraparound, 
in, in some of the multi-sector support processes. But the difference is moving to uh, an arena of what we call risk detection and having the actual services themselves get into the business of detecting risk before harm occurs. And so if you look at the, the, the common and conventional design of the human service system, a lot of it is based upon waiting until there is an incident, waiting until there's a crisis, and then we know what to do. Instead, we turn to human service providers, police, corrections, addictions, mental health, housing, education. We say, look, you know when little Johnny's going to go down a path that's going to get him into, a, into a, a bad spot. Let's rely on your expertise. Let's rely on your assessment of risk to then mobilize an intervention in a rapid uh, way so that we can mitigate those risks and, and mitigate that acute elevation in risk before a crisis happens. And so the need for this historically was first realized in Prince Albert. And, and just up the road here is where there was, there was a, a, a lot of elevation in risk. And at the time, in, in 2009 and 2010, the demand was really high on policing and on the emergency room and, of course, in mental health and addictions and social services. And so the different organizations, the different uh, groups got together and shared their, their frustrations. They shared the reality that continuing to work in the way they were working, in silos, separate from one another, continuing the rigid mandates, wasn't going to get them to a place where they could see any changes in that, in that trajectory. And so it was at that moment, combined with uh, some examination of other models uh, across the world, uh, where the hub model was, was first conceived. And the need, of course, was to mitigate a lot of these elevations, a lot of these root causes of larger societal problems. Now, moving forward, six years later, as I will uh, show you shortly, there is uh, application of the hub model across the country. But the needs are different. Not every city or town or First Nation in, in Canada that adopts this model looks like this. And so when individuals, when communities, when, when community leaders start to examine the, the fundamentals of the hub, some of the first reactions are, oh, we're not PA. I mean, PA's got problems. We don't have problems. The difference is, if there is a, a command for a budget for social services or addictions or police, which there are in most communities, this is an opportunity where human services can actually collaborate together. And regardless if you are the safest, most perfect spot in Canada, or you have a few problems that end up on national media attention once in a while. It's about human services working upstream, collaborating, and trying to interrupt the flow of that risk elevation that leads to crisis and leads to, to chronic high-risk situations. So the influence for the hub model is rooted in a few things. The first thing was some, some research on collaboration. At the time, in about 2009, 2010, uh, the Ministry of, of Justice uh, for the, uh, the province of Saskatchewan have been leading some work in, in, in the policing field around trying to have a different uh, understanding of how police can engage with the community, how police can start to generate uh, more effective outcomes by working in partnership. And so much of the momentum started off within the, the ministry uh, at that time. And similarly, there was also uh, work being done uh, uh, parallel in Prince Albert at a local level, led by the Human Services and the Prince Albert Police Service, to look, about, look at intervention. And what does intervention look like? Instead of waiting until someone ends up in the emergency room and then make a referral to counseling and then wait until so they hurt someone else or they hurt themselves, what if we move in and try and offer them services upstream before anything happens? When these two first boxes were realized in Prince Albert, there was one missing link. And that was, of course, the understanding of risk. And so at the time, uh, a cohort from Prince Albert went to Scotland um, and had, a, had a, an opportunity to view intervention, to view collaboration. And when they came back, it was, a, it was an understanding that risk was something that was the missing link, the missing opportunity. And so if you combine those three influences, ultimately what you end up with is the hub model of collaborative risk-driven intervention. So this is the a picture of the hub in, in Prince Albert, and there are, there are many pictures like this across the country now. Uh, but in essence, what you see in this picture are human service providers representing addictions, mental health, education, uh, policing, bylaw, uh, housing, uh, uh, corrections. And what they do on a Tuesday and a Thursday from 10 till roughly 11.30 
is they meet together. And that is an opportunity where they come to the table, they bring what are called situations of acutely elevated risk, and they share information, uh, very limited information, in a disciplined process with everyone else around the table. So conventionally, if they wanted to share that information, there'd be a series of phone calls and emails and missed opportunities. Here, by meeting every Tuesday and Thursday, if someone finds an individual, a client of theirs perhaps, that is in a situation of acutely elevated risk, they're able to mobilize a, a support team in place right away, and then of course deploy that intervention and hopefully mitigate that risk before something, uh, something occurs. <clears throat> in terms of the actual sectors around the table, it is, is really important, of course, uh, as I had said earlier, to, to have all hands on deck. And, and this, when you work with different hub tables, you start to realize that when people are missing or sectors are missing, there is a lost opportunity there. So you could imagine, for example, if we have a uh, little Johnny here who is a great student, has great A's, uh, involved in the basketball team, volunteers to support elders, but his, his mom uh, has, uh, has been struggling with, with uh, an, an addiction problem. That addiction is accentuated with the violence that uh, the family is experiencing with mom's new boyfriend. And so you have little Johnny, who's a great uh, student and a volunteer and an ambassador of the school, and his risks start to elevate because the stress that he experiences in the home and his interaction with the violence in that home start to compound and, and other risks start to, start to occur in, with Johnny. And so he starts to have uh, some suffer from depression. He starts to, uh, to be affected by the violence that he is experiencing. And so now all of a sudden he's starting to withdraw from school. He's starting to bully some of the other kids. He's totally uh, removed himself from basketball and from, from work with the elders. And so now we have little Johnny who conventionally teachers would think, ah, oh, geez, you know, he's having a rough year. Or maybe his basketball coach would think, yeah, he's obviously not engaged. Or maybe, uh, maybe the social worker would, might, might think that, you know, there's obviously other, other things going on, but I can't quite connect the dots. You bring everyone around this hub, uh, or Boston Bruins uh, image, if you will, into a room, and they're, off, they're able to share information uh, in a rapid uh, opportunity, then there's, an, there's a chance where they can mitigate the elevation of little Johnny uh, pro before, he, before harm uh, really occurs. So the actions that actually uh, are fundamental to the hub are, 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 are in three in nature. The first one is risk detection. This is where we really start to see a change in the human service system. And so, as I had said, conventionally, our human service system is designed to, uh, to respond to uh, incidents, respond to crises, respond to things that have happened. Whereas the hub model has forced us to start thinking a little bit differently and start thinking about the risk factors that lead to that overdose, that lead to that HIV uh, testing of positive, that lead to that arrest, that lead to that uh, incident of violence. And so uh, through collaboration with multiple sectors, through sharing of, of different perspectives on uh, uh, social problems and health problems, uh, there is an opportunity to detect situations where if applied properly, a collaborative intervention would be able to mitigate those risks from turning into harm. The next uh, action of this is the actual sharing of information. Again, somewhat of a new, a new perspective. The difference is that, yeah, historically, in a case management setting, uh, in, a, in, a, in a collaborative network setting, there is a sharing of information. The difference is, this is sharing information without express consent to the client. There is a, a change in the human service pattern with respect to the hub model. Whereas conventionally, moving into a case management structure, moving into a wraparound structure, or a healing circle structure, it is driven by express consent of the client and driven by the identification of human services that that client wants to mobilize around them. However, because the hub model focuses on acute elevations in risk, there are times uh, in that elevation where conventional approaches of asking for express consent or saying, hey, you know what, we'd like to bring some people around to help you, it, it, you don't have that luxury. And so if the human service providers at the hub are able to um, meet the threshold of what is called acutely elevated risk, and everyone around that hub is, is convinced that if nothing is done, something is going to happen, then they move into uh, a, a, a situation where they share information without the ex express consent of the individual. Now, the information they share is very limited. 
It is limited to the point where they can identify some immediate supports and then move on to the intervention. Now, some of you are probably wondering, well, how is that possible? What about privacy legislation? Hub model doesn't move around that. The hub model moves and works within privacy legislation. And this, if you look at the health sector and education and policing, there are clauses within each of the bodies of, of privacy frameworks that identify that if harm is to occur to an individual or someone else in the community, limited information can be shared for the purposes of mitigating that risk and no, no further information can be shared after that. So in principle, that is really what happens in the information sharing piece. And if you think about all the inquiries that have happened in the last 20 years uh, of individuals, of families, and the results of the inquiry tell us that, hey, you know what? Somebody knew, but the information wasn't shared. And so that family was harmed or that individual was harmed. So this is an opportunity where if an if a individual or family is nearing harm, if something is going to happen and we do nothing, here's an opportunity to change that. The third piece of this is the rapid intervention. And the difference, of course, of this is now human service providers are going to clients, not waiting at their mental health office or their addictions office or their probation office and, ex and expecting Johnny to show up because maybe he might be having a bad week, but actually detecting that Johnny is having a bad week, that his vulnerability is increasing, and we are satisfied that something bad is going to happen to Johnny if we don't do nothing then the intervention is deployed. And what that intervention looks like is three, four, maximum five human service providers based on uh, the assets they can bring to Johnny's current situation. And they mobilize together and they go do a door knock. Literally, go to his house, surprised, knock, knock, knock. Hey, Johnny, just want to sit and chat with you. You're not in trouble. We're not here to tell you what to do. We simply want to offer you uh, some services and supports uh, that uh, you might want to consider. Uh, we know the path that you're going down, and uh, we're concerned for you. We want to help you here instead of waiting for something to happen and help you downstream over here. And so that's a very kind of textbook uh, uh, summarized example. Uh, a lot of the interventions do happen in the home, uh, unannounced, on the doorstep. And the value of that is the shock factor. The fact that a police officer, a, a educator, uh, uh, a health representative, someone from addiction showed up, said they're concerned about, about the situation, offered services, that shock factor is enough sometimes to, to, to change someone's perspective on receiving help or, or seeking help. And so statistically across Canada, uh, looking at some of the aggregate data, you're probably guessing how often do people say, yeah, come on in, sit down, I'll get you some tea, what do you want here? 5% actually tell them to bugger off and we're not interested. If you look at all of the human services that are out there, and you ask them their rejection of service rate, likely not going to be close to that, that, uh, that 5%. And so there, there is, uh, for a lack of a scientific term, if you talk to frontline service providers, there's something that's a little bit different, uh, perhaps uh, something that's a little bit unique or, or magic about the fact that five service providers showed up unannounced, no mandate to go there. They're not going to take the kids away. They're not going to arrest anybody. They're simply there to offer services and supports because they care about the, the state of that individual or family. That is what human service providers reflect on as something different. And so when you hear feedback from police or probation or social workers who say for the first time in their career, they have felt like they've been able to contribute to prevention, this is what they're talking about. So with respect to the privacy piece, I think it is, it is very important, of course, for those of you who are um, who are, who are, who are uh, just learning about the model, uh, that there are some very rigorous uh, and disciplined processes in place with respect to the hub model. I won't go into too much detail, but there is a four filter process that is really uh, protected and really uh, enforced around the table. Each agency, of course, is, is uh, expected to follow its own privacy framework so that it, uh, it, it pays attention to what it can, can do and, and cannot do. There is, ha, has also been reviews from privacy uh, uh, information and information sharing officials across the country. Those of you who maybe work in the legal background, you know that privacy commissioners don't pull out a stamp and go approved. However, the closest thing you can get to it is them reviewing the model, reviewing the four filters and saying, you know what, we actually don't have a problem with that. So uh, I, I think that that has been really another reason why we've had such a strong replication across the country because for the last 50 years, human service providers have been too afraid 
to share information when they knew something bad was going to happen to Johnny or Sally or, 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 or Sarah. So with respect to the model, it started, uh, like I said, in one community in Saskatchewan. It uh, very quickly uh, was replicated uh, across uh, the province here uh, to, uh, I think, around 13 uh, is where we're sitting at today. Um, and uh, in the last couple of years, there's been, uh, been a pickup of this model uh, in, in almost all provinces. Some of the reasons behind that replication, I think the biggest one is comes down to pragmatism. It comes down to common sense. There is still a lot of work that we have to do in the evidence sector, in the measurement sector. Uh, and so conventionally, when you see a program uh, get replicated across a, a country or a region or a province, uh, you expect there to be piles and piles of data showing that, hey, you know what, this is on the right track. There are data for that. There, are, there is evidence showing the changes it's making. But the rapid uh, uptake of this model is rooted in, in pragmatism. It's rooted in common sense. And that common sense is, look, we can wait and, and hopefully Johnny will you know, walk into an addictions clinic or go see a harm reduction uh, professional or maybe go talk to his probation officer and say, hey, I'm, I'm going down a bad path here. Or we can go to Johnny and try and connect him to services sooner rather than later. So a lot of the excitement and, and appetite for this model comes from the fact that there is a disciplined process of sharing information without express consent that gets people closer to services uh, sooner than, than later. Across the country, uh, uh, basically a year ago, uh, almost today, uh, the Global Network had done a study of, of all hubs in Canada and uh, identified that there had been 8,500 different individuals who had received this collaborative risk-driven intervention. Uh, my prediction, based on the, the, uh, the growth of uh, hub discussions in Canada, uh, uh, is I, I would say we're at 10,000, based on the growth rate we've seen in the last uh, couple of years. And so there's also been a lot of work in First Nations communities. And so Samson Cree Nation in Alberta was the first uh, on-reserve application of the hub model back in, in 2012. Since that time, also Ermanskin uh, in, in Muscochise, Alberta, has, has also uh, developed uh, application of the model. And here in Saskatchewan, we have both Muscaday and Ochapois uh, nations that have adapted the model. And what I want to talk to you a little bit uh, later is their actual enhancement of the model. Taking this model to a new level uh, where the rest of Canada has actually started to be very interested in and in seeing what they can, what they can learn and, and how this model is, is different. So in terms of measurement, uh, there's been uh, several evaluations of the model, and I was lucky enough to be the guy that uh, led some of that work uh, here in, in Saskatchewan, Ontario, Manitoba, and Alberta. And what we look at in evaluation is not, oh, the hub models, you know, stop in crime, right? Uh, hub models stop in emergency room visits. What we're seeing in the evaluations is that the hub model is improving communication between service providers, that the hub model is connecting people to services sooner than later that clients are actually uh, have greater levels of satisfaction with their service providers. Some anecdotal information, one of the First Nations that I was able to do an evaluation with, the RCMP reported that for the last decade, when there were things going down in the community, people closed their blinds, they turned up the music, they ignored the situation, and they definitely did not call the, the RCMP. However, through collaborating, through showing that there's a genuine interest in prevention, a genuine interest in the, the ownership of that community and the safety of that community, there was a, an increase in calls, there was an increase in outreach from the community to the RCMP to say, hey, we actually see your, 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 your face at the table, we know you're concerned about individuals, and people had actually started to increase their calls to, to support or reports of crime or reports of suspicious activity in a community that was very rife with, with, with high crime and distrust for the RCMP. In terms of actual other analytical data, <clears throat> all hub tables collect data on risk. They also collect data and information on the services that are being, uh, uh, being engaged. Uh, and a lot of these data help us do a couple of things. One, obviously, they tell us what's going on at that table, who are the types of clients that we're seeing. But a very important part of this data is its utility and helping communities get a very frontline, organic understanding of the risks in that community. We can see communities not having to always depend upon Stats Canada to figure out what's going on in Yorkton, or figure out what's going on in Battleford, or Shellbrook, or PA, 
or, or uh, um, Sam Yorkton, what we see is people having a better understanding of the, the actual risks that are happening in that community. And those risks are already starting to be used and that data is starting to be used to plan services, to prioritize strategies, to start to identify, hey, what are the things that we need here? What are some of the services that we're missing? And so these data really help to understand that. <clears throat> the third piece here is the cost savings. And so if we look at the costs of policing, which is really high, health, extremely high, what is the opportunity to, not, to save cost if we are able to get ahead of the problem, if we were ahead of to, to, uh, able to prevent things? And so there has been some analysis on cost savings. The hub model evaluations has been, like I said, uh, uh, been conducted across, uh, across Canada. Uh, a lot of the work has been done lately in Ontario. There's been a tremendous uptake there and an investment in evaluation in that province, uh, as well as uh, there is starting to be some work done in Prince Edward Island, Alberta, and British Columbia. The results of the evaluations, as I had mentioned earlier, focus on service access. They focus on satisfaction with service providers, relationships between service providers, mitigation and risk to the point where risk is actually more manageable. So if you look at some of the individuals and their elevations in risk and where they're going, we're talking about taking someone who might be a hardcore heroin user, breaking into cars all the time, stealing stuff all the time to, to support that habit, bringing them down to a level where at least they're engaged in a harm reduction facility, at least they're engaged in some supports from probation or a, or a, or a court uh, process where they can start to rely a little bit less on some of their, their criminogenic activity and more on the services and supports in that, in that community. Where we think research should be going is to look at actual aggregate risk reduction. Cost savings, just recently uh, Murray Sawatsky uh, and uh, his colleagues from the University of Regina uh, focused on uh, some of the, the short-term outcomes of the hub model in Prince Albert and forecasted cost-saving predictions uh, on uh, interventions over, uh, uh, over a, a four-year period, resulting in $13 million in, in uh, savings on the impact that those individuals would have had on, on Prince Albert had their elevations and risk not been mitigated. So the hub model itself does a couple of things for us. First of all, it offers us a change in perspective. It takes us from thinking about our own silos, from thinking about our own sectors, to one of a more uh, holistic, one of a more uh, uh, multi-sector uh, approach. What we really are seeing here is a shift in paradigm. And so... Those of you in this room that are students or professors, you go back to the library, you pull out every book for the last 50 years, and you think about when things have changed, when things have shifted, what innovations happened in your respective professions that led to those shifts. And I think that the, the greatest term for this movement is, is a paradigm shift. Getting away from thinking about how can my profession, how can my sector respond to that crisis and instead take the tools and assets of my sector and collaborate with other sectors to mitigate some of the harms. Even if maybe some of those risks aren't traditionally my mandate, maybe if some of those risks aren't traditionally in my wheelhouse, I'm part of this team. If I don't do nothing with this guy right now, eventually he will become my client as a police officer, as a probation officer, as a social worker. And so this change in perspective, this paradigm shift, has really uh, stretched across Canada, and it is being manifested in a term called community safety and well-being. So community safety and well-being is really a, a state, and it is where the composite needs of a community's collective uh, uh, safety and overall well-being are achieved. How that happens? Not just through hub model, but through a variety of contributions. But where, uh, you know, to continue the, the sports analogies here, where the puck is going is to a whole-of-system approach where everybody shares the outcomes. And police care more about graduation rates and lower HIV rates and reduced domestic violence rates than just simply focusing on crime and arrests and, and search and seizures. By the way, any students in here, uh, cite me saying this in your paper and uh, I'll make a phone call and we'll try and get you an A in this. That's my, that's my plug. What are we talking about when we talk about community safety and well-being? We're talking about everyone owning the same outcomes. 
No longer looking at the ministry of the economy and saying, hey, you folks in Regina, you've got to get us to where we need to be with the economy. We're talking about getting the ministry of social services and justice and health behind that, that movement. We're also talking about getting the police to own health outcomes, getting uh, social services to start, start thinking about safety outcomes, having education focused on social outcomes and not just education outcomes. Why do we want to move there and why is this movement happening? Because if you think about it, those of you who work in the human service profession, if, why doesn't Johnny show up to his appointment? Why did Johnny fail to, to uh, pass the life skills program? Why did he withdraw from the addictions program? Why is there an elevation in family violence in, in his home uh, or, or dependence on, on the welfare system? Why? Because of the risk factors are all interrelated. And if we continue to work in the different silos that we have been, there is an opportunity to miss that opportunity to change the outcomes. And so I'm going to pick on policing here. And uh, if we look at traditional policing outcomes, we're talking, like I had said earlier, victimization, seizures, breaches, crime statistics. But if we change that, and if the police start thinking differently and looking at different opportunities, we start to have police focusing on these things, on addiction, on family stress, on depression. You just read in the news about, you know, the, the colorful incidents of violence that happened in North Battleford in the last 24 hours. Probably not the best thing to read in the news after just being told by Stats Canada and McLean's Magazine that North Battleford is the most dangerous city in Canada. Police leaders in that community, and Red Deer, and Edmonton, and Toronto, are moving away from looking at this and moving towards these things. In fact, the detachment commander for uh, the RCMP uh, city detachment in Red Deer uh, in responding to the mayor's demand to say, we need to do something about crime. And the news anchor said, okay, what are you going to do about crime? We're going to get some helicopters. We're going to arrest some bad guys. We're going to bust in some doors. And you know what the chief of police said in Red Deer? Let's start looking at this stuff because this is the stuff that leads to changes in crime. Now, again, I'm not trying to paint the hub model as a crime prevention model. We could easily change mental health and addictions and, and housing to be, to be interchanged with this. The point of it is, there has to be a, a shared approach to focusing on what are called shared outcomes. And that is where we see this paradigm shift going. There is another change here, not just focusing on shared outcomes, but on client-centered collaboration. And so if we look at our conventional human service system, okay, so we have, let's say, a guy named Corey up there. And Corey is facing some elevations in risk. And traditionally, Corey goes along and he has a bad day, guess what happens? Corey ends up falling through the cracks. Our school system thought, geez, you know what? He's kind of having a bad day at school, but you know, he didn't break any windows and he didn't beat the crap at anybody, but he's okay. Not much we can do. Housing says, yeah, this guy's application looks like he's, he's struggling with some things. We're going to put him, in, put him into a supported housing program. But you know what? The rest of the things going on in his life aren't really our, our problem. I'm not really sure what we can do about it. He goes into the emergency room. Health starts to think, whew, geez, what's going on in here? But, you know, we'll, we'll treat his, his black eye and his broken leg, but there's not much we can do about that. And Corey continues to fall through the system. Well, later on, we start to see changes in our human service system. And in the 90s, we started to see a, a large development around the title of cooperation. And those of you who worked in the 90s trying to get funds for your organization, by golly, you better have had the term cooperation in your funding proposal or you probably wouldn't have got any money. That language really started to promote, obviously, multi-sector cooperation. But what ended up happening to Corey is he would come in, he would be identified by the school, the school would refer him to health, health would refer him to addiction, justice would refer him to, to housing, and he'd still be kind of not falling through the cracks but bounced around. And really, if you think about the term getting the runaround, that's what we saw largely through the cooperative movement in human services in the 90s. Now, we're rolling up to our current era where we talk about collaborative systems. And this is where we actually see organizations looking at Corey, sharing ownership over his problems, and mitigating the, services and or the threats to services and supports that are there. So this change towards a collaborative model is really at, at the heart of this paradigm shift.
in terms of real practice, where do we see this? One of the biggest champions leading some of this work is in Edmonton. Uh, some of the heavy users of service, some of the RAP-Ed programs, uh, the backbone organization known as uh, Edmonton Reach or Reach Edmonton has really done a lot of work to think, look, let's get everybody in the same room, let's have everybody own the same outcomes, and let's have everybody commit to Corey or Johnny or Freddie or Sally where we can mitigate some of those problems. Similarly, you look at British Columbia and they have a, a large array of different, uh, what are they called, specialty courts or problem-solving courts. Uh, in particular, one I'd like to highlight is the Vancouver Downtown Community Court. Using a case management approach, this court system understands that, that Johnny is in a really vulnerable spot. There's almost chronic high risk in Johnny's life. And so instead of just having him bounce around between the different court systems, let's work through a case management structure to help Johnny at least be stable. Maybe he won't go off and get his PhD and be a, uh, you know, be a, a rocket scientist, but you know what, at least he's stable enough that he can make the, the right movements in his life to become less vulnerable. Another example is the Regina Intersectoral Partnership, uh, known as TRIP uh, uh, in Regina. This is an opportunity focused on youth where you take probation and social services and police uh, and health and you work together and they look at, at individuals that are getting to the point where they're going to have issues with crime, they're going to be vulnerable for criminal activity, gangs, drugs, and they actually mobilize a team around them, provide them with mentoring, provide the family with ongoing case support, and together, by sharing the outcomes of that client, they move into a place where they can start to reduce vulnerability that leads to criminal genetic behavior, violence, mental health, or depression down the road. So what I've shared for you, of course, in the blue zone, where we would have, uh, for example, the Vancouver uh, court, we would have TRIP, we would have Edmonton Reach, and then we have in the green zone, we have the hub model where it's collaborative risk driven intervention. We have one model that is express consent, one model that is, that is uh, um, in, uh, implied consent. How do they work together? There is an opportunity where upstream models, such as the hub, and r models that mitigate uh, chronic risk or high risk through case management and ongoing wraparound can work together. And they have been working together here in Saskatchewan for the last year and a half. Muscaday uh, uh, First Nation and Ochapois have both implemented uh, the intervention circle approach. And what these opportunities are is for the First Nations to take ownership over the well-being of their, their band members, over their nation members. And these, these nations have worked, worked tirelessly to change the way they deliver human services, to have shared ownership. And not to look at a client and say, geez, you know, you got a real addictions problem. Why don't you go down the hall and see the addictions counselor? Or, yeah, you, you know, you're skipping class a bit. Let's, let's haul you into the principal's office and, and he or she can deal with that. But have everyone mobilize a, and form a circle around that individual to figure out all of the different uh, uh, risks that, that that child or, or adult is having. And so the intervention circle approach takes the hub model to a place where risk is identified Services are mobilized, and the intervention is deployed. But then beyond that, beyond that door knock, the collaboration continues. One of the challenges in the early evaluations of the hub model was the fact that there wasn't a follow-up piece. There wasn't an opportunity that, that, that supported or enhanced or uh, encouraged collaboration beyond the intervention. And so where the multi-sector coordinated support process comes into place is to provide the very same rigor and discipline of the hub model, but once you enter a world of consent, once that client gives that full consent, then that, uh, that support continues. So I got a little surprise for two ladies in the audience tonight. The Muscadet Intervention Circle and the Ochapois uh, Intervention Circle uh, were recognized uh, recently in the Canadian Senate uh, as a social innovation uh, contributing to safety and well-being in Saskatchewan. Uh, there were two First Nations that really took, uh, took the initiative to independently move forward, to go in a, in a place of uncertainty and to take the courage where, uh, where, where there, there was none at the point to move this model forward. And so uh, Senator Lillian Dick had, uh, had sent this, uh, this Hansard uh, note uh, to Ochapois and to Muscaday um, and uh, basically applauding you 
for not necessarily taking the lead of the federal government or the provincial government, but standing up in an area of uncertainty and being a leader in community safety and well-being. And so, ladies, congratulations to you and your nations for leading uh, us in this journey. So please, everyone, give them a hand. We will actually be hearing from these two, uh, two ladies uh, very shortly. So, moving forward, there's one more thing we have to talk about. We've talked about changing the human service system focused on clients. We've talked about changing human services for the, for the importance of new outcomes, shared outcomes, changes in, in, uh, in cost savings, changes in ownership. But there's one piece we have to discuss, and that is the system itself. And so all of the effort that I've, I've, I've shared with you tonight so far is about changing the way we do things to focus on the client. But there's also a dialogue around changing the system itself. Because ladies and gentlemen, those of you who have a career in the hu health and human services know that the system itself is designed largely in ways to support itself. The system to where it's been today is not designed to help the needs of individuals. And so this perpetuation of getting complex human service systems, this perpetuation of this is how you get services through our agency, this perpetuation of high thresholds and expectations on clients gets us away from having a dialogue on what's right for the client. Instead, it's a dialogue on what's right for the system, and that's not what it should be about. So in the last couple of years, we've seen people put in opportunities where they can share, they can share data, share data across systems share experiences across systems. And they can actually have an opportunity using frontline experience, using data, to be able to identify systemic issues with our system. Issues that perhaps would not be identifiable if there was not collaboration between the systems. This was first manifested in Prince Albert through what is called the core or the center of responsibility. And if you think about, for example, uh, a system is designed, we have millions of dollars going in to provide services, we have people lined up to staff those positions, we're just not seeing the clients come into play here. Where does that happen? Let me give you a, an example. So in Prince Albert, the high schools had invested a lot of money in putting daycares into their high schools. And this was the idea that, you know what, there are a lot of teen parents out there, we don't want the opportunity of parenting to stand in the way of their education. So let's have daycares in high schools. Well, the numbers for parents in high school was not very good. And so one of the challenges when looking into it was the fact that, look, these young mothers and fathers wanted to go to high school. They appreciated the opportunity for a daycare being in their high school, but they had no way to get to school because the infants could not ride on the bus. And they, you know, when you have a two-year-old on your arm, it's tough to get in that car exactly 7.50 in the morning. And so when the different teams got together and they started to identify what are the problems, very simple solution. Across town, there was an early childhood development program that was having trouble engaging uh, youth uh, teens or um, youth parents. And so by collaborating together, the school division and the early childhood development program, the child program changed their hours just a little bit and they were able to, uh, to drive these young parents to school which did two things. One, it got the, the teen parents back in their desks. Two, it actually was allowed that, that service to engage these youth where they weren't able to engage them before. So again, very simple, very small uh, example. The point of it is, without collaborating, without sharing information about problems and concerns and systemic challenges, the core in Prince Albert would not have been able to identify an opportunity to maybe change the, uh, the engagement of teen parents in, in school. Another uh, movement in, in this system approach is in Durham. Durham has an action uh, approach where they will take a team, individuals from police and from corrections and from mental health and from housing, and they will identify systemic challenges or problems in their region. This is outside of Toronto, by the way. And they will work in a team approach to start challenging some of the conventions around, that, around that, that model. And so through sharing data across their systems, through taking a, uh, uh, an analytical perspective on a problem, they were able to, to move to solutions. Another movement related to this 
is some of the efforts in what we call community safety and well-being planning. This is moving not from focusing on the hub, which fo focuses on people, or systemic solution building, which focuses on problems of the system, but moving towards the all of so society commitment to community safety and well-being. And so two of the pioneers in this, uh, this area are the city of Red Deer and Halton region, which is also in Ontario. Uh, and so really what they have been focusing on is how can the community itself seek ownership over community safety and well-being? How can the community be aligned? What strategies and activities can the community deploy so that everyone can contribute to this, this movement? Not just the police tag teaming with health to, to deal with the drug dealers and drug uh, users in our town, but everyone working collaboratively together to identify some of the risks that lead to drug addiction, which lead to break and enter, which lead to a black market of stolen goods in Battleford, Yorkton, Tisdale, whatever. So, further thinking. What else is going on in this area? Well, beyond what I've described to you already, uh, the Community Safety Knowledge Alliance, in partnership with Ministry of Justice, uh, the RCMP, uh, Defence Research uh, Development Canada, and the University of Saskatchewan, is exploring the concept of what is called a tech-enabled hub. And what this, uh, in essence, is, is if you could imagine a client, an individual that is facing risk, is located in Patchenac, or Crutwell, or Maple Creek, or Dafo. And for them to get access to a mental health worker is a three to four to five hour drive away. So first of all, they gotta get the courage to seek mental health or addiction support. Then they gotta get an appointment. Then we gotta figure out, is anybody gonna show up at the appointment? And then we finally deploy a mental health worker to drive four hours out there, knock on Johnny's door. Yeah, sorry, he went to a party, he's not here. And the mental health worker drives four hours back to their office. Eight hour day, sucked up, don't forget about the $1,500 in gas and mileage and overtime and all that other stuff, for a no-show. The other challenge is, in communities, northern, remote, and rural communities, where there might be some service providers, there might be folks that work in health or addiction uh, or housing, they know that their service is there. But who wants to get mental health support from the, the goalie on their old-timers hockey team? Who wants to go to addictions... Uh, specialist to get support if my kid and his kid are on the same soccer team. This is a reality that is really a struggle. And a recent evaluation of Kuatniathi uh, Mental Health and Addiction Services showed that some of the biggest barriers to mental health and addictions are that familiarity, that concern of a lack of anonymity. So one of the things that this project explores is how in a virtual environment can the hub model mitigate risk and get over the barriers of, of, of geography, get over the barriers of resource, and get over the barriers of uncomfort walking into a building. And by the way, everybody just saw you walk into the mental health center. Obviously, we know he's got a problem. Here is an opportunity where individuals can access services in their own, uh, the comfort of their own home. Another, uh, another illustration of change and, and new ideas is the uh, Saskatoon Predictive Analytics Lab partnership uh, where using data from different, uh, different organizations, uh, using certain predictive modeling, able to forecast where risk may elevate, able to un understand uh, where, where certain elevations in risk may occur and actually start to deploy some support behind that. One of the projects they're developing right now is looking at missing persons. Uh, I, I think there's a lot of excitement to see where this initiative could go. But again, I just wanted to highlight that there's an opportunity here for us to start thinking differently about the way we have been. Lastly, I'd like to highlight that this entire movement around the hub and multi-sector coordinated support and collaborative solution building has really generated some dialogue around what does community safety and well-being mean. And what we're talking about, ladies and gentlemen, is a, is, is a new journal uh, put out by the Community Safety Knowledge Alliance. This journal is a, is a platform, is a, is a forum uh, for not just uh, academics, but practitioners to start uh, dialogue and, and narrative around some of these models. So check that out uh, if you haven't done it already. So, ladies and gentlemen, what we've talked about so far is, is, uh, is really the start of things. And this is not the end of the story. This is the beginning of the story. In the last six years, a model in Canada has been replicated in close to now 90 different locations in six years. 
The last time a model had done that, it had had 20 years behind it, 20 years of research, 20 years of evidence. So there's got to be a lot of questions we're not answering yet. And so moving forward, we've learned about collaboration, systemic changes, multi-sector support, simply for an intervention model. But what else can we learn about our human services that maybe we weren't thinking about before? What are the things that we can do in terms of sharing data? What are the things we can do in terms of change in the human service system? What can we do to pursue outcomes that we can actually achieve as opposed to designing outcomes that do nothing more than perpetuate the status quo of our human service system? That, ladies and gentlemen, is, is the future. And so with that, we're going to have a, uh, uh, a very quick break and we're going to come back in this room and I'd like, to hear, uh, I'd like you to hear from some of the major champions that are, that are involved in this, in this movement in Saskatchewan. On the left here is Ava Bear. Ava is a health director at Muscaday uh, uh, Health Centre. Uh, she is also the co-chair of the Muscaday Intervention Circle and one of the, uh, the first individuals in Canada to lead a table that takes the traditional hub model and adds a component of multi-sector coordinated support. We also have in the middle here, uh, Okimawa Squail, uh, Margaret Bear, uh, who is uh, from Ochapois Nation, and she is a, a, a leader, uh, an innovator that has really moved behind this model in her nation, and I think can speak highly to what the model uh, can offer for other communities across Canada. And then on the left here, we have Constable Jody Colbert from the Saskatoon Police Service, who started out as, uh, uh, as a, what we call a table discussant within the Saskatoon Hub, and is now uh, chair of that, uh, that collaborative. So uh, I'd like you to grab a coffee. Uh, don't try and spill your donuts on this, or the grad students are going to have to clean it up, right, Stephen? Um, come back in the room here in about five minutes, and we're going to hear from some, uh, some true champions of where Canada is going with respect to community safety and well-being. See you in a few minutes, everybody. <laughs>